So hello and thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Jessica Stokes and on behalf of the graduate co-coordinators of Hive's research workshop, Michael over here in the blue bow tie and myself, I would like to thank you all for coming <laughs> to Dr. Petra Kepper's keynote presentation. Uh, to give you some of the buzz about the Hives research workshop and speaker series, I just want to let you know that we have been meeting monthly to discuss the overlaps and entanglements of disability and animal studies in popular culture, and anyone is welcome. Uh, so you don't have to be part of MSU to be there, and you definitely don't have to be part of the English department. Uh, the workshops will resume in January with a discussion on accessible pedagogy centered on a climate fiction syllabus. Um, and our speaker series will be happening in the spring as well. We're bringing poet Jordan Scott and poet essayist and activist Eli Clare. And you can find more information about all of that at beehives.org. It's just beehives.org. Um, all of this work would not be possible without a honeycomb of support that spans MSU. We would like to thank the English department for supporting Hives as a graduate student workshop. We'd like to thank the Writing Center for hosting this event in this oh-so-colorful space. Mm -hmm. We would especially like to thank Legacies of the Enlightenment for their support in making this event happen. We wouldn't be here today without their commitment to the belief that scholarship should be available to people across lines of race, gender, economic status, sexuality, and disability, and their work to make that happen. So before I drone on too much longer, I'd like to hand off the microphone to Dr. Zarina Islami, Associate Chair of Graduate Studies in the English Department and author of The Dream Life of Citizens, Late Victorian Novels and the Fantasy of the State. Um, on top of all the research and labor she's been up to in the department, Dr. Islami is also the professor of our Disability Studies course this semester and faculty co-coordinator of HIES with Dr. Scott Michelson. Please welcome Dr. Islami to introduce Petra Kepper's now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jessica. I want to start off by thanking Jessica Stokes and Michael Stokes for all the work they've done in making this happen. It was completely all of their initiative, all of their vision. Um, uh, as well as the financial support that they received, which they completely garnered on their own. So I'm really incredibly impressed by what they've done. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Petra Cuppers. She's an internationally active disability culture activist, a community performance artist, artistic director of the Olympus Performance Research, Olympias, sorry, Performance Research Collective, and a professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Petra grounds her work in site-specific performance and disability, disability culture methods. She's written academic books on disability arts, dance and somatic poetics, and medicine and performance. And she's currently working on a project called Eco Soma, Speculative Performance Experiments. Her community performance and introduction, which was originally released in 2007 and reissued in a second edition last year, is a foundational text in the field. Her creative books include the Queer Crip Speculative Short Story Collection, Ice Bar, released in 2018, which we read in our class, um, and the forthcoming eco-poetry collection, Gut Botany, coming out next year. She's a fellow of the Black Earth Institute, an eco-poetic community that reforges the links between art and spirit, earth and society. This year, she's the Hunting Family Faculty Fellow of the Institute for the Humanities at the University of Michigan. Um, as I mentioned in our Disability Studies Seminar, we had the pleasure of reading I Spar, the collection of short stories. Um, it's such a rich collection, and it was such a trip, in all the best senses of that <laughs> word. Um, the stories really asked us to think about the intimate interdependencies of humans, non-human animals, and the environment. Um, disability exists in these stories as part of the landscape and as an aesthetic, which invited us to rethink what we knew. Um, I have to talk about Michael's presentation for a moment um, on this text, <laughs> which grew out of the incredibly generative possibilities of this text. Instead of giving us a kind of traditional linear presentation that explained and elaborated, he invited us into a role-playing game in which we got to participate. Oh, oh, we got to so good. <laughs> He emailed, I remember when he, I think you came to talk to me during office hours, you're like, it's like thinking, a role playing game, only if people want to. <laughs> Nobody responded to his email, but he did it anyway. <laughs> so we got to inhabit different characters, we got to choose how the presentation unfolded. So we really got to experience that text in all of its, I think, in, well, in some of its possibilities, not all of its possibilities, because there are so, so many. 
Um, so it was such an inventive presentation that I think was really facilitated by the rich post-humanist world of entanglements that this collection of story dramatizes. Um, so that was really a pleasure and a privilege. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Cuppers. Thank you so much for coming to our campus. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That is just a beautiful introduction, thank you. And I'm just so glad to hear about that. That's like the best way of engaging with this kind of work. I mean, I am a writer and a poet and all that kind of stuff, but really I'm a performance artist. So having people work with that work interdependently in a community is like perfect. That's, that's it, you're just 100%, that's it. I think you should actually be doing this right now <laughs> while I'm reading. I love that so much. Okay, I'm just gonna fiddle this in here. I'm fiddling it in here somehow. No. Okay, I can figure it out. Why does this not hold? Am I fiddling it wrong? Thank it's, you, Michael. It's just very Fiddly. specific. About it's how very it wants specifically to be. fiddled. Oh, thank you so much. That's very well fiddled. All right. Well, it's just lovely to see you all here. Thanks so much for coming out. I know it's the end of the semester and. Um, story time might be a, a good thing to do at this point. I am so grateful to both Jessica and Michael for having me here. This is just lovely. And what you just what I just heard about the role playing is really the best thing. I love the space as well. I love the colorfulness and openness of the space. What a gorgeous place to meet in. And I love you to just make use of this space while I'm reading, you know, so there's stuff for playing with and there's colors on the tables. I invite you to doodle. So before I even get going, why don't you take out a piece of paper and doodle? And, and while you listen, see what images come up and whether there's words that you get excited by and that you might want to color in or that you know, what web might emerge. So let's see what we can do to do this a little bit more as a creative web. And you know yourself, if you're someone who just likes to close their eyes and, and listen, then that is totally great as well no problem whatsoever at all, just want to put in that interesting opportunity because this space seems to facilitate that beautifully. All right, so, and this was a wish list, so uh, I, I wasn't going to read the first story because I know some of you have read it. Who here has read Ice Bar? Let me just ask that. All right, no, I think we're good then with that. We're good with that, so I'm going to read Ice Bar. <laughs> so the first story. I'm reading from the book uh, is actually the title story, Ice Bar. And uh, by telling you a little bit about how it came about, you get a sense of how my, my writing operates. Um, my, my partner and wife, uh, creative partner and wife, Stephanie Hyde, here is, here is with me. And we, in 2016, we traveled quite widely on fellowships, on little artist residencies. Is anybody else here a creative writer, poet, fiction writer? Yeah. Yeah, you so, you, so you know about things like creative residencies and how wonderful these places are. You know, places that open themselves up for international artists. They give you a place to stay for two weeks or four weeks. So we had the pleasure during this year to um, have a, an artist residency in Oslo, Norway. Cool. That was great. And to just work in a wonderful place there. And so a lot of the collection is influenced by the spaces that we visited during this time. My creative method involves going outside and just chilling out, hanging out, drifting, seeing what happens in the city, wheeling around with my little scooty here, and just checking out what's going on, hanging out in cafes, doodling in cafes the way that some of you are doodling right now. That is one of the most generative principles for me, engaging with other people, drifting through the city together. That's what led to this story. She emerged into the bright sunshine, some night day after. She looked up to the sky, some day night after. The sun looked different somehow, not doubled exactly, but there was a too muchness in the air, and a new color to the shadows on the ground. The shadows were smaller, unfamiliar. Alisa took off her jacket, her sweater, all the things she had grabbed fleeing. In bra and underwear, she stalked like a crane through the window opening and into the Oslo street. The sun began to burn immediately. 
She felt the sizzle of her skin's moisture, like a hot, drop, hot plate drop of wax. Quickly, she ducked into the shadows on the other side of the street. A hairdresser had abandoned their studio. The smashed windows were not boarded up again, and shards of glass lay mingled with strands of long, straight black hair on the linoleum. Alyssa saw the hair, stopped. She flashed back to Jin's slender form, the willow waistline that had held her fascination for weeks before she approached her fellow student. Jin had smiled, giggled a bit, when Alyssa had asked her for a drink, for a date. They had, that had been seven months ago. Where would Jin be now? A city away? A continent? Across a fjord? Or in the heavens? Alyssa picked up her drooping shoulders and willed her feet to move further back into the darkly shadowed hair studio. There was nothing fruitful in reminiscing about scents and sweet touches here in the half-light of a too bright day. In recent day-night periods, she had found herself often staying too long, steps and gazes halted by small moments, tiny monuments to the life before. Stop moving and stare a good way to get kicked in the butt by sunlight or radiation. In the back of the studio, Alyssa found another survivor. A woman in a sheepskin's wrap had made a nest for herself beneath the skeletons of the retro hair dryers, hulking shapes of pink and red plastic, upside down bowls to encompass freshly washed and laid waves. It was hard to imagine the hair dryers in use, but they fit right in. Flamingos staking out territory, hipster citations for new androgenies. The woman uncurled a little bit when Alyssa cleared her throat and said a dry, raspy, hello. Hello, please move along. There's nothing here. The water is shut off. Okay, I'm not here to hurt you, lady. And I have my own water. What do you plan to do here? I'm at home. I'm fine. Please move along one of the hopeless ones. Alyssa had met them underground, little broken ones that did not wish to live past the apocalypse, who saw the demise of internet, telephony, and petrol-driven life as a reason to hasten their own demise too. A valid choice, of course. Alyssa nodded and started to move along. Oh, one thing, did others come by? Two, the day before, one the day it happened, you're the first one since. Thanks. Die well, lady. Alyssa moved past the, the felt nest and found the back door of the hair studio. She opened it carefully, peered out. She had been alert to any news, but hadn't heard about vigilantes, the much talked about breakdown of human compassion and morals. Actually, people had been kinder to each other recently, had shared water, even scraps of food. The tunnels had been terrible, but not because of the people. It was the smell that got her out eventually, the hot smell and the press of it all. Also, curiosity. What did it look like above, now that the sun had shifted and found companions? It had been a choice, heat death or cave death. No one had imagined other options or real viable life after. That meant, probably, that she wasn't that different from Nest Lady. Alyssa stepped out of the back door, shouting hi, to whomever could hear her. A high came back. Her ears pricked, but it came back more than once. Just an echo. Vibrations reverberating human-like against the steel plates of the modernist apartment buildings. The courtyard in, in Oslo's Toyen district was shiny and hot like an oven. No one was hanging out here now. Alyssa moved on through the arc at the far end of the yard and into the next street. Cars, tires melted and glued to the asphalt. Small curls of smoke where car mirrors set spots to smoldering. No other movement in the blue air. Above blinding light, the sun or maybe suns had climbed higher, whiteness taking over any shape or contour. Alyssa sprinted across the street, ran along the opposite side where some shade remained. Ran because stopping would mean unsticking her sneakers from the molten pavement. So she touched lightly, taking note of the stores she passed, looking for something to arrest the inevitable. In a gap between buildings, she looked down at the city center and the fjord, its bare dry walls bone white, 
salt flowers over gravel. What had been green looked burned, black, mud, or grey with ash. She turned away, laid her hands against the warm yellow bricks of new houses. The sign shone above her, sparkled in the sunlight. Ice bar. Ice bar? Alyssa stopped, pressed quickly against the black door, and felt it give. It was open. Down she went. As soon as she entered, she could feel the coolness waft up from beneath, a cafe scene behind blackout windows, blonde people nearby, short hair, layered at the back, a careful cut above jean jackets, printed t-shirts, tight jeans, twenty-somethings. An older woman, close-cropped hair, white blonde with dark roots, an expensive parka, leather bag, Doc Martens. Next to her, a young man, brown, long, wavy hair over John Lennon glasses, a moustache that dripped across the cheekbones, long coat, a pagan cross. He turned to her. Welcome. Do you need water? He held out a slender glass bottle, real glass with a wavy design, condensation shimmering the surface. She accepted and nearly fainted with the crispness of contact. It was so cool. She hadn't felt anything like it for weeks. She touched the round glass opening to her lips and reveled in the deliciousness of liquid down her throat. Careful now. She mustn't get carried away. She stopped, sighed. First time here, right? Welcome to the ice bar. Thank you. Thank you. Alyssa was near tears. He knew. She collected herself. What is going on here? This was one of the old Oslo winter haunts, the site of a bar made of ice, midwinter, usually closed in other seasons. But here she was, and yes, there were icicles dripping down from the dark ceiling. She saw her breath in front of her face. She was crying now, and the tears became salt on her skin. Ice bar, dance on the volcano, we will survive. Dance the freaking music, baby. His pupils were wide and dark pools. She got it. Whoa. She released her gaze from his and scanned the crowd, still holding on to the magic of the cool glass bottle. Alyssa remembered the bar from different years. In the deep Norwegian winter, the bar was usually made out of ice blocks, an iglo in the city shimmering blue-green with lights set into the blocks. Hipster bar, also a tourist pleaser, an easy pickup spot, all that. She couldn't remember ever seeing the bar open outside winter time and in artificial refrigeration. But here it was, pulsing with light and heaving bodies. She pushed to the front of the crowd. Everybody was grooving along. Karma Chameleon, blasting full force from the front, vibrating her ears the closer she got to the stage. And there was Boy George, Norwegian style. He was round. Dark blonde hair like whips drenched in sweat, waves of delicious flesh touched with a hint of blue frost. Crotchless pleather pants opened to a large black rubber dildo beating to the music. Two lines of crisscross laces ran up over bulging flesh to a military bra cupping abundance. A small pencil moustache over red lips. He crooned and swayed with the song, karaoke like a swish, fast, 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 slow. This close up by the stage, Alyssa was surrounded by adoration, the, the drag king's entourage in happy 80s flow. Silver lame flashed in blonde and black hair, blue eye shadows draped across freckled rosy noses, and here and there, chocolate skin. Goosebumps embroidered shaking limbs. She took another draft of her cold water bottle and tried to make eye contact. No go. All pupils wide and lost in the charm of the music. She pushed to the left of the stage, to the curtained off area between the well-stocked bar and the runway. The music followed her, but the light and cold did not. It was more mellow here in the shadows. Up ahead, Alyssa saw the next performer getting ready. She approached, ready to try again to ascertain the meaning of this ritual and its connection to the sun death outside. Hello. Hello. The answering voice was mellow, with a hint of kindness, interested. It emerged from a wrapped form lying on what looked like an autopsy table. Stainless steel without grab bars, a wheeled contraption on high shine. 
The small woman had just transferred to the table and her wheelchair was standing idle alongside like a pony having a rest. She was arranging a sheepskin beneath herself, tucking small limbs onto the fleecy surface and away from the steel bite. I just got in here. Why is this place refrigerated? What is going on? Can you tuck this piece over there? My partner seems to have lost their way from the bathroom. Alyssa complied, gently folding a piece of suede under a creamy, tiny thigh. The flesh was warm, pliant, and she, fil she felt a thrill run through her. The performer noticed. Come with me, newbie. Come onto the stage and sing. You'll see and find your answers. She extended a small, perfectly formed arm, dimples at the elbow. Her fingernails were painted dark green with sparkles. Alyssa took her hand. Boy George came off the stage in a rush of sound and applause, screams echoing into the curtained corridor. He darlinged his way past them, into the far bowels, bowels of the bar, into the dark. Alyssa could see blood dripping down his bare back from scratches that had opened the corset laces. The small woman next to her tugged at her hand. I am Minerva. It's our turn. Just follow. And Minerva directed her to push the autopsy table down the corridor. A helper appeared suddenly from the depth, a hummingbird creature in lilac and purple eyeshadow over soft brown eyes and skin. Batting eyelashes, they directed Alyssa to push and laid their own long pale blue fingernails alongside Alyssa's splintered messes. Together they trundled the autopsy table up the wheelchair ramp to the stage. That's as far as the hummingbird went. Releasing the table, they walked backward after depositing their tiara on Alyssa's head. Minerva directed Alyssa to position her in the network of stage lights. She bathed in the beams. Her little limbs moved fluidly through the air, pointing to where she wanted Alyssa to push. Finally, she was bidden to drop the brakes on the wheels. When Alyssa straightened from her task, a new person had arrived on stage, a flash of sequent tubes with a microphone in their hands. Alyssa took the prophet mic and Minerva invited her to hold it close to her small rosebud lips. Minerva breathed into the mic and for the first time, Alyssa became aware of the audience beyond their bright stage. The breath had pulled them in, forward, with the out-breath from the little mouth releasing a wave of relaxation across the wide ice bar. It ribbled out all the way to the guy with the long hair who had given Alyssa her water. She could see him, quiet and dark, a greeter on the threshold. He seemed to nod at her. She refocused and, listening to an in-breath from Minerva, saw the crowd lean in toward them, eagerly waiting. Music. Flashing lights, Minerva opened her lips and smooth operator ballooned into flight. Alyssa just held the mic still and solid. From time to time, Minerva laid her tiny hand on Alyssa's arm, emphasizing a sighing moment in the song's unspooling. The crowd was blissful. Swaying creatures lined the edges of the stage walkway beyond the sharp edges of the autopsy table. The song ended. Minerva closed her perfect eyes, eyeshadow in peacock stripes sending light signals into the universe. The crowd went wild. Applause and shouts. Alyssa saw them and saw beyond, too, the giant air conditioner chugging and heaving high in the vaulted ceiling. It shuddered and waved electric lines out toward the crowd and the singer. Minerva sucked in air through her perfect pout, and Alyssa watched one of the cables lash forward toward them and sink electric wires like fangs into a fan's back. A small man, white skin under leather doublé, heavy boots. She jumped back with a tiny hop, but he, Minerva had fastened a small hand on hers and steadied her. The crowd kept shouting, undulating, and Alyssa could see the court fan wriggling in ecstasy on the live wire, not two meters from the stage. Then the wire released with drips of red blood and coiled back to the ceiling. The crowd shifted down a notch, calmed themselves. Some turned to their drinks. The drippy staggered a bit, Alyssa saw, but kept upright, facial grimace unreadable. Pain or pleasure? He looked a tad pale, stunned, but okay. 
When he turned, Alyssa could see the jagged scratches where the cable had taken its bite. The doublé had shredded decoratively, decoratively along the back, weaving a new pattern of skin and leather strips. Ignoring his bleeding back, the man took a beer someone had offered, glass dewy with cool condensation, and drank deeply. Minerva signaled to Alyssa to undock the autopsy table's wheels. She took a small bow, blew a kiss into the crowd, then the hummingbird was back, and the two of them guided Minerva's chariot down the ramp. That day night, after the lights went out, Alyssa shivered on the floor. Hummingbird had given her a blanket, something that looked like it might have been one of Minerva's sitting blankets. Lamb's wool, small tight curls, pressed and shaped into hollows and rises, near bald in spots, but still fine to cover herself with as she curled into sleep. She listened to the wind in her lungs, the in and out of her own cave breath, and touched the knot of fear deep inside. Alyssa stayed at the ice bar. She became an act with Minerva and Hummingbird and refined her costume. Instead of her black bra and panties over sneakers, she added combat boots and found a different bra with a netted back on a recently passed woman in one of the dungeons beneath the bar. Every night the air conditioner drank its fill of patrons and performers alike. It seemed fair to Alyssa, in the harsh light of blue and pink ice days, everything needs fuel and humans had used up their allocation. Why not be fuel and enjoy the process of heating oneself to the right temperature? Dancing away, there were little cool ice cream bonbons with molten warm hearts, disco balls of liquid delight. The performances died down a few hours after the heat of the day, and punters and team alike just went to sleep where they stood, curling limbs into one another for dream safety. After that, in what would have been late afternoon or early evening in the prior time, a crew came around with sandwiches. No questions were answered, and so she stopped asking, what meat is this? Where did the bread come from? Why does this taste so salty? It came, and then the performances started, started up again. All the while, they stayed cool, and no one, no one at all, re-emerged from the front door and saw the street again. In the few hours of dusk, dawn, openness, a bit of wanderlust might lead one to the toilets, to the warren of tunnels beneath the stage, to the dark round holes that seemed to lead to other houses. But no one went to check on the street and the open air beyond. That life was gone and done behind a crystal rainbow curtain. Tonight was her night, her first solo act. Alyssa was nervous and tight with pulse and feelings. Minerva had been the one who told her. The management thinks you're ready. I think so too. Go on and wow them, babe. Do you want to use my makeup chest? Everybody was so friendly, so sharing. But Alyssa couldn't even remember ever having seen so many lipsticks, eyeshadows, liners and false lashes in one place. She opened box after box trying to decide on her new look. She had already found a piece of music in the karaoke box. Private dancer. That was the one. So now she wanted to do a Thunderdome look to go with that black-white, white-black, outback queen. She assumed this to be a command performance, a one and only. She was ready for her swan song to lift into the cool moon. The night day. The stage. Minerva and Hummingbird kissed her. Boy George gave her a wax flower, a dark purple day lily which sh shaded into black. She clipped it into her short curly hair. They all touched her, braille love on her bare skin, new old family. She smiled and released the last smell of fear from deep in her lung wings. She let her fear fly, ascend in her thorax, up through the windpipe, and when she finally stepped into the light, the crowd, the song, her mouth broke open and it flew and flew and touched the snake's sweet mouth and then they were one, the bird and the snake and the lung and the cave and the planet and the sun under the Thunderdome. Later that night day, after her flight, Alyssa rested in hummingbird's brown sinewy arms. A tattoo of a kiwi bird was by her nose a kiwi that had stepped out from an impossibly dense bush and had lifted its long nose beak toward the moon. Alyssa felt the pulse in the back, the crusty dancing of knitting flesh and blood. 
She felt an island of peace seep from the open delta. New parts of land rise from salt and sea in the solar plexus, a liver sifting and shielding, kidneys to winnow old and new. Minerva had come by for a while in her small pink wheelchair and had brought warm tea, a delicacy here in the land of cold. Alyssa had felt the surge of blood tight in the salty warmth. They would go on, soaking and receding, filtering into the electric purity of the snake's mouth. They would worship the cool moon. Outside, the neon sign was still lit in the never darkness of day night flickering into the stillness of the dust street. Here was the ice bar, harbor, ocean. All right. That was ice bar. Yay. Yay. I'm just going to get my water for this minute. So that was the, the party story. It's the first story of the book. And before I move on, maybe I'll give a little bit of second to see if there's any questions or comments that people have, you know, like what came up for you? What's in your doodles? And you don't have to give me something back, but it might be nice to just have a have a bit of an engagement. What did you did you feel invited into this ice bar? Do you have any comments back? Anything anybody wants to say? Yes, my dear. I wrote down a couple of things that I really liked. Um, I wrote down too muchness and day night and one other one that I didn't have to. Oh, dream safety. That's nice. Yay. Yeah. Envisioning how we can be together differently, right? If it's no longer bourgeois little boxes with a single bed in it, how else are we? How else can community be made in a future that none of us know? So this, anybody else would like to say something? You have so many words written, just uh, doodles of an ice ingot. Oh, that's They're nice. Like a literal ice bar. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool too. Great. Yeah. I was just struck by um, how much that the sensuality of contact didn't feel like an imposition. Mm -hmm. Like we, there was some, some kind of agreement to touch mm -hmm. um, that, that was like community at yeah. the instance of contact, right? I mean, that moment where she, uh, there's that, that crispness of touch of contact mm -hmm. with the ice bottle becomes uh, kind of the first moment where uh, a certain invigorating uh, communal touch becomes activated throughout the story. That's love, yeah, I love that. So senses and thinking through things like how a bottle is a passport into something, right? That's, yeah, that's love, I love that. And this, of course, as you can probably imagine, this came literally from hanging out at the bar before a performance <laughs> in Oslo. You know, so it's totally like the, the, the description, the, it emerged from a free ride at a bar before like a really strange modern primitive performance in some dungeon like place in, in Oslo. Yeah, that was pretty fun, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and so conceptually, a lot of this emerged from uh, reading Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble. I don't know that anybody has read that. Some people are nodding at me. So there is, it's a book of complex and really intriguing thoughts about uh, where we go from here and where we go from here together. You know, what, um, what we're doing on the w in a world on the edge of certain kinds of collapses and yet also with a sense of, of entanglement and ongoingness. The eighth chapter of that book is the book that's really most interesting, I think, to those of us who are creative writers. Because in that one, she writes about an experiment, an experiment where she uses, she or, uh, together with a uh, community of other writers, <coughs> is using creative writing as a research methodology. And that's what I find most interesting. So in that chapter, they are writing the story of um, the new world. You know, the, the catastrophe has happened, whatever that is. And now at this point, small groups of people come together and live together and find new rules of living together. Uh, they engage in creative practice together. There are rules of how uh, procreation can happen, complicated ones. And one way of, of shielding 
humanity against, um, again, trying to take over the planet and destroying the planet, is that uh, animals become part of the human genome. So they, the newborns have, and I, I'm not going to go into the, too much into the details, but they basically are joined with another species. And as they're developing, elements of the other species, which includes the monarch butterfly, emerge in these humans. So that idea of a small group of people under pressure, I mean, this is, this is not a utopic, what I just read to you is not utopia, right? So instead, humans are also fueled for a certain kind of technology. But, so it's not a utopic vision, but it's one that's also not dystopic either. There's new forms of sociability, new, um, yeah, the dream safety, right, that you picked up on, new ways of being together. That is very much inspired by that sense of, well, what would it mean to be on, the, on that threshold and how we move forward? So that's like an imagination that comes back again and again. Yeah? Um, the, when you talked about this, you know, nine, being neither utopia nor dystopia, mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of points that stuck out to me because I, I spent the entire reading sort of on that edge. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, because the comments about a woman who died in the was below mm -hmm. and yeah. the salty meat with no questions answered. Right. What is going on? What's going on? My doodles are like a series of layers mm -hmm. where it's the, the like the sun and then the street and then the ice bar and then the dungeons. I love that. That's um, great. Yeah. Anyway, and so uh, that anyway that that is all very intriguing to me. Yeah. Oh, that that's very intriguing to me too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and that's that is exactly where I was living. Um, and the, throughout the whole story, it was just like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. Is it ever going to be revealed? And because I love the moments of. It's almost that there's that nexus between humans and machines mm. with the cord latching into the people. And it's like almost this, this cyborg moment of like the blood um, then feeding into the machine. Mm -hmm. But I like the way that Alyssa then frames that as saying like, okay, this is this combination of both this pain and ecstasy, ecstasy that you can't really tell the difference between it but we're complicit with like, okay, we have to give a little bit of blood to continue this lifestyle that we're moving into. And so, yeah, I definitely read that it's neither utopia or dystopia, but we are making new sorts of compromises to exist in this space. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Those yeah. were interesting spaces. Yeah, and it's also interesting to be a writer on the edge of genre work, right? So this okay. is... This one is probably of the stories in Ice Bar. It's the most science fiction-y, I think. They're most, most of the others are, they're all sort of in the dark fantasy realm. And with the dark fantasy, I point to the fact that I don't explain, you know, like, like it's not that kind of world building where you first have five pages of explaining how it all works. Um, it's dark fantasy. It often has horror elements as well. But what is so interesting to me as a usually more poet working in this genre, someone who loves reading horror, and dark fantasy work is how I can take images like that salty flesh, right? I mean, that is that that soil and green, you know, is probably in, in or or crowd piercers, you know, what that's what snow piercer, you know, snow piercer is probably in quite a lot of people's minds or, or image and or brains as they're listening to this kind of story or they're reading this kind of story. There are all these layers of stories that. There. That is the, hum the, the hummus for what we're doing. This is a work that, again, uh, Donna Haraway uses in um, Staying with the Trouble, the hummus of the world that we have created. How can we grow something new out of that? Hummus as in earth. I'm German, so I sometimes pronounce things weird. Is that the right way of pronouncing it? Hummus, yeah, good. It's not hummus, I know, hummus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that the, the genre features the... Um, having this, this density of material is really exciting to me and it's interesting to me to tell stories that don't have to, that, that, that have points running out and I very much hope that maybe some of you will take one of those lines and, and, and write. Maybe there's an encounter in the dungeons, for instance. Maybe there is something about the salty meat. You have your hand up as well, so I don't know your name, but someone over there, you had your hand up and I know you're not responding to my visual cue, so. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you talking to me? Yeah. Okay. I am. So I guess I was wondering, before you write stories like this, do you yourself know what's going on in that world? 
No. no. <laughs> Basically, not That's so much. Fine. No, no, I really, I really write in free write in space, very much influenced by space. And I, I teach, um, I have a class called Dark Fantasy, which I love. And it's dark fantasy, not just in the sort of dark stories, but also dark fantasy in the sense of reclaiming Lovecraftian stories. So H.P. Lovecraft is a terrible, racist, misogynist, misogynist, terrible writer that many people love. And I love him too. And so do many people who are women of color, queer. It's, he has created a universe called the Mythos universe that many people uh, take and, and, re and reshape do something different with. So dark fantasy also refers to the fact that so many writers of color have taken Lovecraftian universes and reshaped them, make them their own, expose um, racism that underlies the stories and also push it into new territories, right? And push it into new delights. So that is the edge that I love writing on as well. And that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to explore with my students. And when we do writing exercises, we usually try to, to write from a particular space and the races, racialized, gendered, um, uh, ableist markers that pervade a space. So we're trying to get our cue from the spaces that surround us, if that makes sense, and then see what openings emerge, what portals emerge, how we can touch that world in different ways to get a story going. So in this case, going into this, uh, this, uh, uh, I have the German word in my mind, friseur salon, into the hair salon and having these flamingo shaped pink plastic hats, right? So that, that became for me like the portal with which that story opened. Cool. Next story. I hear another one. Another one. Okay. I'm going to read you now a story that's quite new and it just came out. It's not in the book, so I thought maybe there would be people who read the whole book, so I'm just going to give you something extra. That's for the two of you, basically. You get this as a little extra. And, uh, and then we'll, I might come back to one of those. So, uh, in a new body of work that I'm engaging with, I'm really looking at space. You know, I'm moving away from these very, these still very grounded, recognizable um, earth spaces that are kind of the, the, the place of ice bar. And these here become now Far future tales were not immediately on the cusp of or right behind some kind of catastrophe. We're now quite a little bit further along. Uh, space exploration is a thing. And many of these stories in this new, new body of work uh, look at the relations between humans and non-human others in a slightly different way than the Ice Bus stories did. Um, so this piece came out in... Uh, you know how that happens? You're like giving a public presentation, just drops right out of your head. I'm just going to let that go. A British, um, a very well-known British science fiction magazine. That is not in my brain right now. Shoreline of Infinity. Thank you. Thank you, brain. Just dropped it right in there. Shoreline of Infinity. So it's like a, it's like a middle of the road science fiction journal. And I find it very interesting to see where I can place these stories, where they go, because they, they all have these really weird surrealist imaginings which don't necessarily fit with, say, hardcore science fiction. And so it's interesting to see how far I can tease out stuff. And some editors write to me that they take the story, but it's like a prose poem. Because for them, this is more a prose poem. Does that make sense? You know, it's like, so this also has these elements. It's called Mercury Worms. More story time. Enjoy your doodling. Alex screamed for the earthworms. She screamed for the brown promise of their spring wriggling. Once, when she was about 10 years old, she had walked into the forest, not far from the house she shared with her grandparents, parents and sister. She could still feel the suck of the earth on her rubber boots, the ever-present grind deep inside her knees, the clammy feel of rotten wood as she tore at the earth. She remembered the plank that had locked like a vacuum seal in the dark moor soil. It came up with a sigh, with a stink, and there were brown earthworms beneath the ghost-white root fingers. Earth undulated like a dragon's spine, hidden nostrils behind tree stumps. The path was a muddy snake, dripping leaves glued to the branches like vines in Tarzan movies. 
The ghost fingers reached out for years, cool and hot, cauldron breath in her bones. She saw snake cousins in the poor worms, the sideways sway, the desire to crawl back undisturbed into the winter soil. Eventually, the plank lid lay discarded. A tremor had rushed up her legs, and there were more eyes, Simon's eyes, judgment, dare, and question. Had she been found wanting? That's how it felt, at least now, in sepia-toned view. She longed, she screamed, she reached for the worms. Alex awoke, the skin of her legs prickling in the regenerator beam. Pink pajamas cloaked electrodes that lay along the smarting bones. Electricity tickled the creaky globes of knee joints. The capsule of her bed pod rested on quake-proof runners, ready to respond to any seismic activity by dropping a large metal frame around her. If that should happen, she would wake up inside a cage, unharmed, with access to communication and emergency food. Her pod was large enough for two, or for a human and a number of companion animals. Alex had chosen to sleep alone, though, and her occasional human bed companions dreamed in their own pods far away. Simon had never been among them. A childhood crush hardly ever survived hormones, puberty, and adulthood. But strangely, Alex thought to herself as another jolt of regeneration undulated her leg muscles, Simon kept intruding in her thoughts. The night lay heavy on the desert and on the new metal abode hut that housed Alex's pod. Stars rose and fell and the moon crept bloody on her spherical path. In the spaceship far above, cruising past Jupiter, Simon laid hands on the joystick, more a remnant of childhood joys than a necessity. Any real course connect corrections would be done via control, and there really was hardly any way that a pilot could operate the complex array of systems required to escape planetary velocity. Psychological tests had decreed that these old forms of control hardware soothed long-distance pilots and their crews. They were memory objects, honoring old forms of being connected to the world through technology. His fingertips nuzzled the folds of leather covering the semi-spherical object. He remembered caresses, the loving touch of David, Jason, Dwayne, so many others, names he did not know, hands that were not hands, but appendages of other kinds. Simon remembered alien drinking holes on distant planets, the queer nod that set up scenes that went far beyond gender, but ended in the same place. Shudder, release, an opening. A moment of his childhood rose up again, insistent for days, ever since he had firmly decided to leave. There had been a girl, a different kind of iris opening, and the world had changed. Alex stirred into the morning. Fake desert air drifted into the pod as she released the locks. She activated the comm unit and checked in on her messages. Coffee hummed soon into completion, vitamin capsules, her exoskeleton clicking into place around her midriff, hips, leg bones. She moved over to the old-fashioned table on the patio and started work. One e-com was intriguing. Alex stared at the picture that had arrived. No subject line, no written or recorded content, but not spam. It was a worm, brown-red, an alien creature in macro view, sucking round organ mouth, open and grasping, sensory hairs around the opening erect and alert. Simon willed Alex to understand, to ping back, to find a way. He could not think of another ally, only this childhood friend. Each night for weeks now it had come back to him, the moment in the woods. Alex lost to the edge, him afraid, nearly pissing himself, aware of power circling around the forest glade with its spring melt. There had been Alex, her hand rubbing, legs in white trembling stunts, eyes wide. Beneath her, the tangle of white and brown, moving, escape velocity, the triumph, release. The image of her white mouth was burned into him. If only he could reach her now. 
the ECOM tracked bizarrely, with waylaying stations all over the galaxy. Alex put her best tracker skills to the task and lost herself as the graphics began their elaborate dance between stars, fields, amplifier ships and relay drones. Then the computer interface blinked and belled. She had initiated a crawl of the image, image's data itself to see if there was any other information encoded in the worm image. Now the image scrolled over her comm interface with little squiggles shattering the previously smooth picture. There were messages hairline code tangling into the color commands. The computer had already executed the, the commands necessary to assemble and translate the binary data. A new message assembled on top of the straining worm head. Please come, earthworm, remember the plank. Alex remembered. The night's dream rose up again, already plowed under in the sequences of everyday life, but now reinstalled in its vivid colors, smell of fecund earth, crisp air, and Simon stare. He had been initiated. That's what the plank meant here. But what about the worms? She blinked, and the display shifted back to the tracking software, still tracing the ecom's parabola across known space. Then it stopped. Alex stared at the readout. Solar System, Explorer Class Emigration Ship Tiresias, Sender ID, Simon Herfluke. Simon from the Old Forest, on a trajectory far away from poisoned Earth. What did he want from her? She began composing a reply, careful to match the level of security protocols Simon had used. Not exactly hard to crack, but requiring specialist tools, enough to escape casual attention. No one was watching too hard. Simon opened his morning e-coms and bounced on his cot. She had seen it and replied. With some luck, he could leave knowing that the news was in good hands and that he could go out with something more like a clear conscience. It might suffice. So he wrote, Alex, forgive me for disturbing you after all these years. I am leaving Earth. It's the final time for me. And on the journey, I recognized what I had been amiss to not lay to rest. The worm and the roots, they are becoming one. I have seen them climb up your legs. I have seen them sink into your limbs. They are moving now, connecting new orifices and bodies all over old earth. I don't know if you ever plan to go back to old earth, but if you do, look for the worm roots. They are still searching for you. I know, they spoke to me. They called me often, and I was afraid to go back. So it's my message to you, a coward's message. You did it then. Can you do it again? Stunned. Simon, what did you do to me? Alex's hands netted, touched the barely responsive flesh on her legs, then the reassuring cool of the wheelchair's titanium. Going back to Earth, back to the last smells of soil and real water, open water, not the red desert of Mars or its rebreather packs. Would she do it? Was it possible? Of course it was. Alex had already initiated a credit search measured against current commonly avail available transport links back to Earth, a rarely used route direction, but one that was being traversed all the time by the ships that brought fleeing Earth people to the new pod cities on the planets. She could do it. Credits were fine. It was cheaper than she, th it was cheaper than she thought. At least one star glider transport company had their hub not far from her childhood home. Alex had no idea what Simon expected her to do, but she had felt the flower of brown-white tendrils tangle like snakes in her mind, itching to get out. Alex composed an ecom to the chief of the Planetary Planning Committee, as it was to be her turn to present new hydration plans in group tomorrow. The reports were all done and uploaded. The physical presence was not an absolute necessity. It rarely was, which was good, given that she was often unable to leave her pod at all. She looked at her calendar and dealt with similar smaller issues, all clear. The e-com with the ticket came through just as she finished a message to her sobriety sister, explaining why she would not be at group, but that she was okay, fine, actually better than fine, for the first time in a long time, with a goal, with a place to go, with a ridiculous but pressing quest. Her sight ached and her toes were frozen like blue ice veins, but she started packing for the 1700 shuttle to the currently deplaning Starglider. 
Above the glider, it was dark, an obsidian luster, cushy, but with glints of sharp edges. The authorities had worked out that a journey that evoked womb embrace would lead to a better take-up of, of new world sensoria upon arrival. Wombs were hardly ever bitingly sharp, of course, but there were also dwindling resources and credit inflation to adjust to. Wheeling to her belt station on a return journey rather than an outward journey to the next place was a weird sensation and ran counter to all design elements of the glider. Never mind. Alex clicked herself in, initiated the lay flat feature of her chair and curled as far as the metal frame would permit. Most of the journey would happen in Syro sleep. She scooped up the tablet lying ready by her console and adjusted the monitoring cap on her head. Within minutes she was gone and didn't even notice when the back end of the glider closed, shutting out the last remnant of red Mars light. They took off. Earthlight. To Alex, it just felt like the next morning. She was stiff, needed to both piss and drink copious amounts within seconds of waking. She pissed in her chair pod, knowing that the cleansing routine would take care of it. She had no time to get her wheelchair upright and into the bathroom. The electrolyte balanced drink helped clear her. At the far end of the glider, the ramp had descended and morning dawn light broke across the metal. No one was around. The crew might still be asleep, apart from the lonely pilot, pilot in their capsule. It was a full Earth day before the glider needed to be got, got ready for the return journey, full with weather emigrants. So Alex collected her stuff, initiated a quick cleanse, and still dripping, rolled down. The light broadened, opened. Her childhood light, her dream light, lumens that were unmatched on exoplanets. She started to cry as the light touched her, air touched her, fabric whistling in the wind. There was a copper tang to the air. Something was off though, as if a hurricane was coming. A light redshift, barely noticeable. Alex rolled across the tarmac, through the station, and out the other end toward ground transport. The tenth self-driving taxi was accessible, so she waited patiently till it was her turn. She gave the address. It was the nearest street address she could remember. The small forest itself had no address, no coordinates that she could conjure up. Alex felt silly, impulsive, gliding noiselessly over half-drowned villages, encroachments of salt-laden seas far into the plains of Middle Europe. She felt reasonably confident that her childhood village was still on maps, otherwise the Satnav would have informed her otherwise. About 60 feet above the waterlogged strata of old Germany and old Netherlands, her taxi flew at medium speed. ETA, 24 minutes. Alex stretched and gazed out at the level horizon. Eventually the taxi glided to a halt, opened. The red laser light played across her fingertips as she paid up, then left. She was on solid land on a road. Around her, houses stood alert and awake, even though it wasn't yet 7 a.m. local time. Windows blazed over soggy front gardens, lawns long replaced by rain gardens or sunscapes. To her left, Alex saw the dark fringe of the old forest. It was still here. She wheeled forward. Alex, I knew you'd come back. Alex stopped, wheeled about. She stared faster. She needn't say more. The tone full of repulse as well as nostalgia. Forester, gatekeeper, old man, leech. I, I know, I know. Water under the bridge, Alex. Sorry for the old days. I got a bit slower. Alex remembered. It had been normal then. It had been normal then. The casual violence, sexual harassment, locker room talk. These days were gone, and Förster must have gone through re-education given that he was still around and walking freely. She looked for the bulge of an electronic collar around his ankles, found no sign. He stood firm, a walking stick by his side. Hey, how is the neighborhood? The same. More and more are leaving. The sun hasn't really been out for 12 years now, waterlogged. Berlin and Bonn are no help, nor is Strasbourg. It's gone to hell. Where do you live now? Alex talked briefly about Mars. They described the land changes they've lived through, a red sun up on desert land, the shimmering line of a horizon that is water in water, heat, drizzle, decay in their different forms, 
They enjoyed the exchange and old anchor. Long old stories, not exactly forgotten, but laid aside for the sake of finding a spindle, a single sharp moment in the past which, with which to spare the present. How did you know I'd come back? Didn't Simon tell you? The worms are calling for you. Can't you hear them? They're calling you now. We, the old ones, are no good to them. Furster stood silent. Alex stared. The edges of the man began to swim, to shift. Was he really there? The light crept up, still not really sunlight, oyster color, luminous gray. It shone through the old man, a breath. He was gone. Alex's fingers were icy on the wheelchair controllers. She reeled away toward the forest's dark edges and their black watercolor light. It was near noon when she arrived. The forest was thinner and smaller than she remembered. She had to navigate multiple pools and small streams, find ways to measure for depth to ensure that her wheels wouldn't wet to the electronic hubs. So it took a while, even the rugged all-terrain wheel set. She nearly got stuck on the path's grave dark soil. The fungible stuff still clung lightly, then packed and caked to everything. Eventually she found what she thought was the old plank, a rectangular ghost of matter, fungoid silver. She could hear them now. There was singing here. There was movement, shifting, delay and echo. She wedged one nerveless foot under the edge of what was left and heaved with her arms and upper back. The worm was a river in the earth. Its back looked like what she imagined an alligator's skin would look like up close. Dikes and canals, patches, all glowing orange and white in the wet afternoon light. Its girth was larger than her waist. It moved gently as it pulsed earth through its innards, winnowing and conditioning. The hint of translucency brought her an image of a dark vein of soil. The worm didn't seem to notice her. It was alive, despite the earth's poison. Her titanium wheels felt clumsy next to the articulating segments of its broad length. She contemplated touching it, but decided against it. Didn't wish to become aware of its temperature, the cold-blooded lack of differential. This had never been her, even as the worm's ancestors, or maybe sisters, had found their way in. The worm was transforming the metal poisons Alex knew in her bones. What was she to do here? What did this massive worm want from her, guarding a golden, lead or mercury hoard deep by the river's bottom? Was it inviting her to dance in attendance in dark wells? All very unlikely, laughable, no good to a drowning world. Alex was cold. But she wasn't giving up. Simon might have been a dreamer, but he was no fool. She couldn't even think about Furster. So she investigated around the worm's pulsing presence. Soon she found a second weaving, another source of movement, less strong, less grand. It had escaped her at first in the giant swelling worm dance. At the edges of the worm's embedment in the earth, white brown roots formed their own rhythm, a dance that was half complex weft, and half actual movement, an ultra slow breathing, plant, triple time. This was her interlocutor, the plant worm that had called, not the ancient giant sucker. Alex stemmed herself up from her chair and then lowered down to the soil. The sucking pipeline didn't shift rhythm or otherwise indicated interest. The root worms, though, they knew. They hove up one rootlet at a time. A worm sensory organs grasp upward, a dance in the pattern of a mimosa's leaves uncurling. It came, they came. Alex lay, arranged her legs next to the gap in the earth, her torso outstretched so her face was near the root strands. She welcomed them, opening. Mouth open, zippers undone, cool, moisture. A squelch as she shifted into a more comfortable position. Around her, skin breathed. Her own skin shifted spectral color, darker, lighter, violet spectrum, brown, purple. Mushroom drifted, mushrooms drifted spores, spores so long extinct in so many sites of old earth. The waiting rootworms had held on to these tiny black dots, 
and unclasp the spores from thin mantles wrapped around their withering lengths. The spores entered Alex in multiple sights and her eyes color shifted too, a deep blue shining upward. The giant worm next to her in the earth felt it, shifted infinitesimally. It unleashed new young ones, new root graspers that melded with and opened Alex. Code flowed, nerve and metal knit, blood and plasma. New sensations climbed up from blue toes. The back of knees signaled in. The back of a mountain range answered. The moon sent Morse codes full of gravitational pulls. Alex's liver felt them and responded, giving up its meld information, beeping back secrets to plant mitochondria. She noted ice under her soles, individual crystals first burrowing toward then breaking into her flesh. They rocked themselves into her, she into them. She breathed with them. Slow, equalizing, ice and heat and rain and the slow tilt of a sun's axis. They laid there, entwined, till the sun broke through above Alex, the worm, the nest of weaving tendrils, creatures, rootworms. The sun warmed her, offered a new surface against which to assemble. Eventually seeds safely deposited, the rootlets withdrew from orifices they had so tenderly explored. Alex sat up, hand reaching for her wheelchair. The metal had warmed under the late afternoon sun an orange-red ball so long unseen in these latitudes. She used a combination of strong hands and numb feet to find enough leverage to pull the plank back over the forest worm bed. The sun might do damage, withdraw too much water. This was better. Alex shifted back in her seat, turned her chariot and wheeled downward, her nose open to the mold smell of fertile soils and decaying leaves. What had been unraveled was knitting together again. The sun kissed her face, and a mercury tear ran down her cheek. Hey. That was actually the first time I read that in public, so that was really fun. It was a little bit more dense than the last one, so, you know, it's okay if you're not quite sure what happened. But once again, anything that anybody would like to say? Let's open it up again. What did you doodle? I was noticing the word drift, oh. the verb drift. Because mm -hmm. um, the spores are moving through drift, and you described your process as one of drifting and wheeling when you started speaking. So mm -hmm. I was hoping you could say more about this idea of drift. How does it differ or not differ from the from a derive or a wandering, yeah. right? Which, which seems very romantic, but the wandering seems very wandered, lonely, etc. But the drift seems distinct from it. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm thinking a lot about the movements of of non-human others. You know, what do you like? What does I? When I was writing this, I was reading what I think a lot of people were reading at a time. You know, um, uh, the. Uh, Förster is, is the word for forester, right? You probably, I think you probably figured it out. So the German word Förster is a perfectly good second name, you know, really normal, and it also means forester. And at that time, everybody was reading The Secret Life of Trees, right? Anybody read that? Some people are nodding, or you kind of know, some people know about it. So this whole thing about how trees communicate, uh, there's, there's multiple books now, and of course the Overstory, you know, this, the book that just won the Pulitzer Prize, Richard Powers' book, The Overstory. Um, so that, that's the kind of slipstream in which this is written. So I was very interested in what um, different temporalities would be for drifting. Indeed, derive, you know, which is really central to my working practice as a performance artist, but what does that mean in other times? You know, I'm interested in planetary times, mushroom time, some of you probably read, or might have read, The Mushroom at the End of the World, Anna Singh's really fabulous book um, about, again, different kinds of connectivities across the planet. So that's really some of the material that is really helpful for me and, for, and gets me going for when I write. Yeah. Thank you, that's a really nice question to think about. Yeah. I, I have a related question. 
Uh, it was so beautiful to listen to that story, and I hadn't heard it, although I because I'd read the Ice Bar story, so mm -hmm. it was familiar to me, but I was struck by the narrator, I think, in both stories. And they seem similar. There's this kind of a pattern there, and I wondered, to get to Divya's, Livia's question made me think about the narrator as drifting, mm -hmm. too, and that this, that these stories seem to create worlds, but they don't seem to create like these totalities. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not a narrator who's like, a victorious. and this is how it all hangs right, together. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, like, as a victorianist, I'm used to the, like the novelistic, you know, whatever. Like here's the whole social world, yeah. but that this is a narrator who really follows very closely a character, or in this case, two characters. Right. And their experience, their sensory experience, even yeah. if it's kind of breaking down and merging with other mm -hmm. uh, beings that it comes in contact with. So yeah. I just thought was really interesting and very unique. Um, and yeah, that's, so. that's like all, the whole of Ice Bar is like <laughs> that way, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So there's a kind of drifting there, too. Yeah. About the An authorial stance about what is interesting, right? And yeah. the next, it's all within the sensory. Movement. Yeah, and I'm, I'm working right now on a novel, actually, so I, you know, I do give myself the task from time to time to do something different. It's so different. Oh my God, it's so different. So hard. <laughs> so anybody here writing a novel? No one's writing a novel. Oh my God, novels are so hard. It's so hard to hold all that stuff in your brain and you do have to make some sense of it. Yeah. I mean, in this short story, I'm, I'm giving, I am giving myself permission and I'm glad that occasionally people who publish things, editors also grant that permission to drift. Right to to be, you know, to, to make some there's there's a sense, but there's also the surrealist uh, way of being in the world and being penetrated by the world. Um, in a novel, I think that would be really hard. <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to that's that's for me a really interesting question in a novel: how to world build and create a coherence and a narrative that drives, and yet also stay in this very close. With, you know, that's really close, um, it is third person, but a close third person that is really very involved with the sensory immediacies. So that is a really interesting challenge for me and I thoroughly enjoy doing that right now. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you were, if this, while I was listening to you, I was thinking of Malina Haushofer. Mm -hmm. so, uh, oh, yes, I remember that. I, yes. Yeah. That I'm, I don't remember. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, that was. I, mean, I was a child, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's a German drifting with the the wall that was. We never right. quite know what's happening, and it yeah. goes across the lands. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, I was just remembered of that with the fusion with uh, between the human, the woman, and then the animals, the earth. The earth. That and is such a fabulous them. reference because I know that totally, and that makes so much sense that you yeah. see that in there. Stephanie, I don't have my pen out. Can you just write down that reference for me so I re remember that? Because that is, yeah, I read that in German, of course, yeah. and I was like a young one. And yes, it was a really interesting, surrealist, literary approach to this fantastical theme. Yeah. It's a little bit like Stephen King's The Dome now. You know that? The Dome TV series? Mm. Anyway, similar sort of, it has like a, a non-explained mm -hmm. total alteration of the landscape that creates these barriers. Cool. Thank you for that. See, all our unconsciousnesses, you know, the things we barely remember. You were talking about Victorian Vel Mel uh, novels. I was had Melmoth in my brain the whole time right now, you know, like this whole Gothic stories and also incredibly site-specific. I remember being always fascinated with the stories of the castles and also the layering. You mentioned earlier the, the layering of, of, of site, and that is so central to Melmoth as well. These different meetings that happen just around the corner from a... From a Arc. I get a very cl strong sense that five o'clock is, is might have it's, it's not the ending. That was five thirty, wasn't it? Just checking in. About ten minutes. Until okay. 5 oh yeah. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that's how it goes. Five o'clock was probably the ending point for some people. Uh, yeah. So we have a few more minutes for questions. Alternatively, I could read you a teeny tiny little glimpse of a poet of a poem piece. Would you like that? Why don't I do that? Yeah, so, uh, so hopefully you've got a good sense of the, the trajectory, the creative trajectory that I'm currently exploring and the interest that I have in bringing together, you know, in, in the interest I have in creative methodologies. You know, so I am really leaning into something like Donna Haraway or uh, Sings, the, the Mushroom at the End of the World, which are ways of writing that are quite different from traditional academia, but allow us to, to feel differently with others, 
And that, that's really the, the motor of a lot of the fiction work. And it's also the motor of the poetry work. So I have a new book coming out in March with Wayne State University Press. It's called Gut Botany. And it is a book that engages um, survival. It has on the cover, it's a beautiful sturgeon. You know, sturgeon the fish. So this is a massive, huge sturgeon that's taking over the whole cover. I love it so much. And um, I have the, the sturgeon on there because it's a fish that survives deep in the water. It's this dinosaur fish. And the story of the book is very much about surviving sexual assault. And I'm very much writing as a white settler on indigenous ground. So I am I'm thinking about sexual assault and women land metaphors a lot as I'm writing this. So I'm going to share now with you just the opening poem. And I haven't really begun to do much reading from Gut Botany yet, so, you know, this is a, this is a nice way for me to attempt to do that. Um, I tried to print out, the, the book is just so deliciously beautiful because they gave me color inside. Whoever gets color inside a poetry <laughs> book? It's just so good! So they did this beautiful job. And I can't show it to you because I printed it out in black and white. <laughs> but uh, this piece, this is all orange in the book. And it's very hard to see because it is this uh, uh, like grayscale. But in orange, you see a sturgeon. Can you just about make that out? Can you see that sturgeon there? Sturgeon is, is like pointing up. Normally it would be like this. But all throughout the book, the sturgeon is like this, which makes it look like some really weird human. In a way, there's some really interesting human, human animal mergy thing going on, which I adore. And it's in orange, and in other, it, every intertitle in the book has a different color. And my own, my instruction to them was to use the colors of the inside of the human body, and they did the best job with that. So they have all these really interesting, vivid, red, maroon, purplish kind of colors, unbelievable. But you know, you'll see it eventually when it's out in March. So this piece is called Gut Botany, and it is literally an instruction. I love you to actually do it with me a little bit. I know we're sitting. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and do weird stuff that way. But there's like three instructions in it, and I will mark when they come. So this is the beginning of the book. Sucker punch. The knife in the street. Fear into being sheared out of the stream into the backwater. Dead fish belly up by the side of the pond. Pills and poisons and endings. Let go and sever the ties and ignore. The party is always elsewhere. A shadow in a canoe in a photo. Likely put on Facebook tomorrow. Fake of having fun behind the grass. Tree. A Stephen King book where I know the next sentence already. Primacy of white masculine fear. Close the leaky gut, body drained of tears. Just speak. Walk with me. Close the loop. Bow forward. Pour yourself into your capable hands and hold your heart. Okay. Bow forward. Pour your stomach into your feeble hands. Release the binds that bind so tightly to your spinal column. Up again. Bow again. Drop your sexual organs into waiting hands. Wait. Breathe in. Out. In. Soothe. Fish slip into the labyrinth of intestines. Cruise past the atlas, feed on the carpet fibers of worry. Agile between the lung pearls, hollow behind the liver, green wall, delicate black veins spider along for companionship, dark purple, maroon. Fins soothe the red spots of tension, white bands where muscles have leached nourishment out of tight bands. Between kidney and uterus, Raspy tongue licks soggy dahlias on their stalks. Ovaries bloom. Glide, mucus oils the way. Swim among the velvet. You and me into plump cushions. Sturgeon tumbling ground. Thank you. when you read all these three things together, it's just all one thing, isn't it? It's <laughs> only one thing. It's just all really just one thing.
All right, we have maybe five more minutes left, so let's see. Any other like wider questions beyond the writing, creative methodologies, stuff like that? Yeah. Could you talk across writing fiction versus poetry and if there's anything different in your process between those two spaces? Yeah, there's a lot of difference between writing that novel yeah. and writing my poems. <laughs> <laughs> and the fiction is very much in the middle. I mean, it really does feel like prose poetry most of the time. Yeah. What is different? Um, well, I love reading uh, popular cultural novels. I mean, it's like totally, that's what nourishes me, including The Wall. Um, so that's, yeah, it's like, it's, it's the imagination of that work that I find so fascinating. I have, re I love non-realist embodiments. Mm -hmm. You know, I've really always chimed with non-realist uh, non settings for human bodies. You know, bodies that pulse and live when they're turned inside out. Which, which means I love, I love horror, basically, is what I'm saying. And not because people die at the end. Yeah, okay, that's the horror, that's the narrative. But the moment of intensity is in the middle. You know, that's the part that I'm really fascinated by. That's what I'm drawn to. Like, alternative configurations, often that boundary between pain and pleasure. That's really exciting to me. So I explore that with rhythm and the sound and color of words in the poetry. That's kind of where the main emphasis is. Then there is more of narrative and and, personif and, and a character development in the stories. You know, I'm really interested in, in being with the character as they go through this world. And then there's novels where I am indeed, but that my novel, of course, is a quest novel. I think no one will be surprised given what you just heard. So it's a quest novel of this bunch of really interesting, sweet people whom I love every single one of them. I've lived with them for so long now. I'm just so in love with them. And then I had to kill one. It's just killing me. Uh, you kind of have to. I just ever want this thing to get going. Uh, so it's this quest novel. and But it, it uses the same kind of mechanisms I think are so important. Sensual engagement with the world as a disabled woman. Sensual engagement from a place that is usually seen as not valuable in the world. So that's really core to all of my creative writing engagements. It, it's kind of 5.30, but I take the last question if you want it. But we can also just go and have drinks and foods and put our doodles away. Stephanie. Are you, do you have any interest in talking about your other current project, about Ecosoma, which feels like it Oh my god, academic stuff. Oh my god, oh my god, yes. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Stephanie, my yeah. wife. <laughs> Whoa, I just feel brought back to earth. <laughs> uh, no, it's lovely. I love that project too. And Ecosoma um, speculative performance experiments. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it explores a lot of what we're doing. It actually feels really weird to have all these projects going on at the same time. It's like a little bit too many projects at some point, but they are so interwoven that I I. There were forms of ecosoma where I felt that it would have fiction as part of it. I kind of took that out again because also not everything has to be everything, right? It's good to have different, different parts. So in ecosoma right now, I've been looking at a lot of Detroit performances. So I live in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and I'm on fellowship right now. So um, I am tracking and I am with, I'm being with performance experimentations in the city of Detroit and else place. And I'm using a lot of what you just identified as the authorial stance, you know, that kind of closeness as a, as a, a phenomenological inquiry into what it's like to be in these performance spaces. So I'm not just watching stuff that's up on the stage, but it's usually participatory performances where I'm in a shared environment with the performers. So either a workshop or an, a performance installation or an, a, an, a dance piece that happens in a park where we are all in a shared space. So I'm writing about this these performances as hopeful performances of towards otherness. A lot of this is across different boundaries, whether it be race, disability, or um, uh, settler status, indigenous settler status. So those are some of the, the kind of organizing categories of, of the different chapters in there. And yeah, I'm using, I'm using a phenomenological lens, much more clearly pulled out and, and, and kind of named as such in order to engage these performances. So that's, yeah, very, it's actually a really good question now that I kind of think about it. Good question, Stephanie. <laughs> it was kind of a bit, you know, yeah. So it's a good question in that it really is, still is, of course, a piece of the same thing. It's a different kind of attention, but one where I'm in the wonder of the other in a different way. Yay. Cool.
Thank you so much, everybody. It was absolutely wonderful to do this here. Thank you. Yay. Great engagement. That was very nice. Lots of questions and comments.